By the latest uh, research, 28% of car all carcinoids occur in the lung. Embryologically, we have the foregut, which is the lung, the thymus, the stomach, the pancreas, the duodenum, and in women, the ovaries. And then you have the midgut, which is the small bowel, the right colon, the transverse colon, the left colon. And then you have the hindgut, which is the lower colon and rectum. Lung carcinoids are part of the foregut. Lung carcinoids are thought of as so-called typical carcinoids and atypical carcinoids, which correspond to grade one and grade two uh, malignancy. The typical ones, the grade one, the low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, the ones that we call typical carcinoid are slower growing and have a slightly better prognosis than ones we call atypical carcinoid. Symptoms of lung carcinoid may be uh, either nothing and they're just found fortuitously in the, in the course of a chest x-ray usually, or they may be recurrent episodes of pneumonia, always in the same section of the lung or they may be coughing up small amounts of blood or persistent non-productive cough. Um, they took a CAT scan uh, out of uh, my chest and that's when they found the tumor that was sitting on my lung and um, actually I was coughing up blood before so that's how they, they found it. One morning I woke up and I coughed up a whole cup full of blood and um, I was pretty upset. I was actually very scared. They put a scope down my throat. They saw that the blood was coming from below my throat. And they gave me a CT scan and they found my tumor that day. Lung carcinoids um, usually don't cause carcinoid syndrome with flushing and diarrhea, although it's possible that they can. Um, they often will make other hormones such as um, ACTH, which causes too much cortisone type medication in the body to, to, to form the adrenal glands will make too much cortisol and people can end up gaining weight and having other complications of too much cortisol. And I was diagnosed with carcinoid syndrome and I was placed on Sandostatin LAR, which um, I expected it just to control my flushing, but it did much more than that. Um, it actually um, helped me get rid of this uh, persistent cough that I had had for years. The lung neuroendocrine tumors that are very benign in their, their uh, behavior, surgery and, and, and long-term follow-up may be all you need. Bronchial carcinoids can be a real challenge and they sometimes, re the reason that they sometimes can be more confusing cases is because they're managed by a different group of people. They can be managed by pulmonologists, they can be managed by, you know, more pulmonary oncologists. A, a lot of um, lung carcinoid patients at that time were stating that um, they didn't feel that they were getting adequate care because they were just seeing a pulmonologist and um, a uh, lung surgeon and they had a cancer and how come they weren't seeing an oncologist? But we feel that their behavior is still very similar in, in fashion to the neuroendocrine tumors that we see all over the body and that we still feel that surgery is an extremely, extremely important part of their care. So surgery should be done by a very experienced thoracic surgeon who understands carcinoids and understands that they are cancer, even though they are not as rapidly growing as other lung cancer, they need to be treated properly, and that um, surgery is usually very successful in controlling lung carcinoids. In these cases, imaging is extremely important because it's good to try to know where all the disease is before you enter the operating room. So once you have a good idea of how much disease there is, then you want to go get that. So I was very fortunate. I didn't have to have any chemo or radiation. Um, they went in on that Friday and actually had an incision on my back. Um, they went in and uh, what they did was they stretched the ribs out and went in and, and took out the lung. Um, so I didn't have to have, um, didn't have to break any ribs any, either. Um, luckily I was young enough that they went in and stretched them out and, and removed it, removed the tumor. We have certain operations called sleeve resections to try to remove the tumors that are more on, in the bronchial part of it. And there are operations we call VATS, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, where we can do it a little more minimally invasively. But it's very important for the surgeon to have experience because what we like is to not only remove the tumor, the primary tumor that's there, but also the lymph nodes associated with that bronchial. And so by doing good, accurate imaging and good surgery afterwards, we hope for the very best outcome for these patients.
most of the organs in the body come in doubles. And really, if the lung function is good and you have only one lung, you could actually manage quite well with one lung. That's an operation we call a total pneumonectomy, where you remove uh, one whole lung. And sometimes that has to be done, unfortunately, because the tumor sits right at the center of what we call the hilum of the lung. It is a serious operation which requires serious preparation too. In those young people who have strong lungs, who don't smoke, who don't have a history of emphysema or any other lung disease, they usually have enough lung capacity to survive and to really do quite well. Most people with lung carcinoids can be treated by just removing a piece of lung and can do fine and have a potentially curative surgery without removing a whole lung. The most important thing is that the surgeon and the patient work together and they talk about the risks the benefits and what to expect afterwards. But in the right situation, a patient can do very, very well and can accommodate very well with just one lung. As I was laying there, one of the things I said was, you know, what am, you're going to remove a lung, what can I do with one lung? And they said, well, you can do any normal active life other than run a marathon. So that was one of the things that obviously inspired me to, to run a marathon. And um, a year and a month, I ran a marathon after, after the surgeries gone from literally trying to run around my neighborhood uh, three quarters of a mile, couldn't even make it on the first lap the first time that I tried to now run uh, uh, 12 marathons. Initially it's not easy because it's a big operation. There's a long incision and there can be a lot of pain and it can be very difficult to breathe very deeply. But it's very important to recover from it and to go through the correct pulmonary rehabilitation so your other lung can be strong enough to support you. One of the things they told me was to, uh, when it, during uh, recovery, was to go through a straw, was to breathe through a straw to try to get my capacity up. So that's one of the things I did uh, quite a bit of, and um, my wife always said that's probably one of the best things I did during that time was I was doing that constantly. Before anybody ever has a lung removed, they should have what's called split function pulmonary uh, tests where you can tell how much of your breathing is done by each lung and how much blood supply is going to each lung and how much you would really lose if it turned out your bad lung is mostly filled with cancer, let's say, and it isn't doing much for you anyway and you don't have that lung, it's not even gonna make much difference. But if that lung that has the tumor is doing most of your breathing, it would be a problem. So you wanna know these things in advance, plan it out very carefully with pulmonary doctors and um, thoracic surgeons to make sure that it, the um, post-operative situation is good. Your at-home therapy definitely is uh, one of the best things that you can do while you're while you're doing going through recovery or um, just continue to live that be, you know better lifestyle.